friends, it is good to be back. And I wanted to come back to y'all today with a video about some of the books that I've read this summer. Um, and I'm starting out with the best books that I've read this summer. So these were all books that I gave five star ratings to in my reading journal, which is sort of a new thing that I've been toying with. And then towards the end of the video, I get into some more updates about this channel and sort of where I've been the past couple of years. So without further ado, let's just jump into some of my summer reading this summer. So I have a fat stack of books here that I wanted to talk about today. And again, these are all the five star books that I read this summer. And you'll notice that there's a lot of physical books here, which is unusual for me because I'm normally more of a digital reader. I've been accumulating physical books because I actually want to, um, decorate i have like an empty wall in my house that i want to decorate with books because that's sort of one of the things that i really enjoy um so that means accumulating some actual physical books so it's really mainly for decor but it works out because i actually do these books anyway so the first book i want to talk about is the reformatory this is by tanana reeve do she's a horror writer and i've read a couple of her books in the past and this is a relatively new release so i wanted to get my hands on it and it did not disappoint. This is probably, if I have to say, my favorite book in the entire stack um, because I couldn't put this down. And it's horrible in not the general way that horror stories are. It's scary in in just how brutal the the sort of racism is, I think, is more so in this book. But it is a ghost story. So there are ghosts, ghosts in this book. They're called Haints. And they haunt this reformatory where this the sort of headmaster of the reformatory has been treating the boys that get sent there very, very poorly. So any of them that die, they kind of stick around and they haunt the, the place. They haunt the kids um, and then they haunt the adults there as well. So the book follows a young boy who gets sent there because he was trying to defend his sister. Um, but the problem is he was he's a little black boy and he hit a um, or he kicked uh, one of the white kids in town that comes from like a very wealthy, influential family. And that didn't end well for him. So that's how he got sent there. And then his sister is fighting to get him out. Overall, a really, really great story. Highly recommend. It was worth the read. I also listened to an audiobook while I was reading along with this. Yeah, and it was great. The next book I want to talk about, sticking to the horror genre, is Grady Hendrix's The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. This isn't new, um, but I hadn't ever, I hadn't read anything by Grady Hendrix. And the reason I picked it up is because I was at Barnes & Noble and I was buying Stephen King books and I was talking to the cashier and she mentioned that if I like King, I should try Hendrix. So I tried it out. I really enjoyed this book. It is it is funny. There are points in this book where I legit laughed out loud. I read another one of Hendrix's book this summer and it seems like he does a very good job of incorporating comedy into his horror. But in this book, it follows a group of women and these are Southern women and it's set a little bit in the past so it's not like super contemporary, but they have this book club where they read a bunch of like horror books, which is uh, I guess outside the norm. Like they're not reading super, um, I guess hoity-toity books, if you will. This new guy comes into town and one of the, the women in the book club is convinced that he is a vampire. And so she's trying to convince the other people, but everyone thinks she's nuts. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's a woman. So no one will believe her or the other woman in the book because they are women. Um, and so everyone, the, all the guys think they're nuts essentially. And the guys are friends with the guy that is a vampire, but you know, people start dying. And so she's working hard to get people to believe her. Overall, great book. I really enjoyed it. Um, if you're looking for a little bit of comedy infused in your horror, I would recommend. All right, we're going through this list. Next, we have Stephen King's You Like It Darker. Um, I love all Stephen King, to be honest. So this was a new release and I picked it up pretty much on release day. This is a collection of short stories. I have only read one other collection of short stories by King and that was the If It Bleeds books. Overall, I really enjoyed most of the stories in here. I wouldn't say every single story is a hit, but the ones that were hits were really truly hits. And then in here, I would say that was Danny Coughlin's Bad Dream, Two Talented Bastards and The Answer Man. And I think of all of these, The Answer Man might have been my favorite because it's very, so I think King is, I mean, he's quite old now and I think he's reached the age where he's sort of contemplating life in a very fascinating way. And it's showing up in his writing a little bit more. And The Answer Man is, is a really good exploration of that. It's a story that is going to stick with me for a long time. And I, I really enjoyed it. I don't want to go into a lot of detail on all of the stories because that'll take way too long. But for The Answer Man, again, it's got this undertone of sort of uh, reflecting on life 
or it follows this man over the course of his entire life from when he's very young to when he's essentially on death's door. And it does it in a very fascinating way uh, that I really enjoyed reading. Two Talented Bastards I liked because it was, um, it's got this nice supernatural element to it um, that I thought was pretty cool. There was like a uh, sort of alien involved in it. So that's why I liked it. And then Danny Coughlin's Bad Dream was just, it was just a weird, weird story uh, but a really good weird story and Stephen King does this very well it, he just had a really bad dream but it's like it was a vivid dream that could have been real and it kind of turned out to be real and then this whole series of events follows after he discovers that his dream was real and I feel like it's weird because we all have those vivid dreams every now and again that feels like they could have been real and it sort of explores what happens when in this case it actually was real so those are my three favorite short stories um, I find that they were the longer ones Ones, and I think that I am not a short short story fan. I think I like the ones that are just a little bit longer. Danny Coughlin's Bad Dream in particular was more of like a novella. So that one was pretty long. Next, moving away from horror. That was like three horrors in a row. I do like horror. We have uh, Romance, The Paradise Problem by Christina Lauren. This was a, also a fairly recent release and it was everywhere. So if you walk into any bookstore, you're gonna see it. It's nice, beautiful, bright green cover. And I really enjoyed this book as well. I tend to, for whatever reason, lean away from giving romances five stars unless they're like really, really good. Um, so this one actually was really enjoyable. It was funny. The basic premise is that the the woman in this novel had been married to a guy for, it was free housing or something or lower cost housing, um, but he's super rich and he had a stipulation in his will or something, or in his inheritance actually, where he has to be married for five years in order to actually be able to receive the money. So they have to convince his family that they're a real couple. That's sort of the basic premise behind the entire book. But overall, it was enjoyable. That's why I give it five stars. I just enjoyed it. I thought it was really funny and I liked the characters. Generally, I like Christina Lauren books. Um, the Unhoneywoomers is my absolute favorite by them. We have another Stephen King. This one's older though, Mr. Mercedes. I haven't read the Mercedes trilogy, but now I do have this and I have Finders Keepers. Uh, the reason I wanted to go back and read this is because I love the Holly character. So I've read Holly, I've read The Outsider, which Holly makes an appearance in, and she also makes an appearance in one of the short stories in If It Bleeds. So I've read like all of the later Holly stories, but I never read sort of her origin story. So that's why I wanted to read this and it was really good. I wouldn't say this is horror, this is more like a, a crime thriller, and, and King does do those from time to time, following the Mercedes killer. So this guy runs a Mercedes into a group of people, and then Bill Hodges, who is the detective, actually, never caught him, and then the Mercedes killer begins taunting him. Um, and so they're just kind of, the rest of the novel trying to catch this guy. It was very suspenseful, and that's why I liked it. It kept me reading, and even though it's fairly long, uh, so like 400 and some odd pages, a little less than 450 pages. It reads very quick because the writing is so suspenseful. So I really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to the next book, Finders Keepers, which I do have. All right, now we're moving on to, uh, actually yeah, the rest of these are all nonfiction. Um, I don't know why I had such a hankering for nonfiction this summer. I'm normally, I mean, I do read nonfiction, but not a whole lot of it, but these were all really good. So the first one, Cobalt Red. The subtitle, How the Blood of the Congo Powers Our Lives. This is by Siddharth Kara. And this is a relatively new release. This book is so sad. This book is devastatingly sad, actually. It's one of those things where, I don't know if you guys do this, and maybe I'm sort of a masochist in this way, but sometimes I just sit and contemplate the amount of sort of human suffering that occurs in this world and the amount of cruelty that people can sort of inflict on each other. And this is an example of that. And I was very ignorant to this before I read the book. Um, and then I went on YouTube and watched, there's a bunch of documentaries on the um, cobalt mines in the Congo. But the story follows, or this book follows the stories of, of lots of young people, mostly young men, that work in the mines and more dangerously, particularly in the tunnels um, where they're digging up cobalt. So cobalt is the metal that's used in a lot of the rechargeable batteries that are found in our phones, computers, uh, etc. So basically anything that is a rechargeable battery probably has some cobalt in it. And most of the world's cobalt comes from the mines in the Congo. Um, it's, a, it's a crazy number, I think it's over 80%. So basically the vast majority, uh, which means that we all use devices that are powered by the cobalt 
that is dug up by uh, these people. And they work in atrocious conditions, truly, um, and earning maybe one or two US dollars a day if they're lucky. And I think the main point he mentions is that there's no real way for the tech companies that claim that their cobalt is clean to actually know that because all of the sort of tainted cobalt, tainted by child labor, etc., and all of the cobalt that's officially mined all get mixed together. And so that the origins end up being unclear. And so overall, this is a great story in how uh, heartbreaking it is and something to be worth informed about, um, especially as we move toward electric vehicles, which is sort of the next big push, which are going to have to use metals for batteries and those metals have to come from somewhere, which likely means that people are going to be mining them. Overall, this was, it's not an easy read um, because again, it is so heartbreaking, but it is not that long and it's very well written. I will say I enjoyed his writing on the matter. And, and you can just tell that he cares very much about this topic. Um, it shows through in the writing for sure. Next book, also nonfiction, this is called Belly Woman. And this is by Benjamin Black, who is a doctor from the UK. He's a gynecologist. And this book, I randomly picked up. I was at a bookstore. I saw the cover and I was like, wow, that's really striking. I think it's just a mixture of the color and the image. It's, it's, very, it's a very well done cover. So this book is sort of a throwback. It's a recent release, but it talks about the Ebola crisis that was in West Africa. And this was around 2013, I believe. So it's been some time and I've, I had forgotten about this actually until I started reading this book. The reason I give this book five stars is because he writes this book even though it is nonfiction and he's describing the events of the Ebola crisis essentially as it unfolds, he does it in such a way that it feels like, it almost feels like a suspense novel, not in like an insensitive way. I don't know if I'm describing this well, but the way that it is, it is very easy to read and to want to keep reading to figure out what is happening as he's like unfolding the events um, from the very beginning of the crisis to when they realized they had a real problem to when finally the international community sort of stepped in. The doctor himself, like I said, is a gynecologist. So he was working at a women's clinic. And so he was sort of telling the story of those women and the care that they were receiving both before and during uh, the Ebola crisis uh, because it greatly affected the medical care in the region at the time. And after reading this, more YouTubing, right? So there's a lot of videos you can watch sort of documentaries on the Ebola crisis in West Africa. And that was really helpful because I could actually see a visual description of the things he was describing in this book. Overall, really great book. It's primarily set in Sierra Leone. That's where he worked during the clinic. Uh, but this outbreak affected Sierra Leone, Guinea, and uh, one more country. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Um, but it is a neighboring com country somewhere in that region. All right, we've got two more to go. So we have The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. How the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. So this is all about cell phones. Um, so cell phones and young people and how it's essentially sort of rotting their brains. So in this book, he is mostly talking about how the increase in the usage of cell phones has affected the mental health of the sort of younger generation. It's a little bit past my generation because I didn't even really have a cell phone until college, um, or I didn't have a smartphone until college, and that's the key here. It's really the smartphones, the ones that have access to internet and social media, et cetera. And I mean, I work in school, so I can see the effects of this on a daily basis. Uh, there are certain kids that I have that I, I know for a fact are completely addicted to their cell phones. Um, and I think for us, because we did not necessarily grow up with that, it's a little bit bizarre. Like for me, I'm not addicted to my phone. I'm not on social media, um, hardly at all. And that's another thing he addresses, sort of like the adults that are in charge of these children. They also don't understand it to that degree because again, we didn't grow up with this stuff. I, what I really liked about this book is that he does a very, very good job of outlining his points, summarizing his points, and also referencing his points. Um, so you've got good references in here and you've got a lot of good data in here as well. So he also sort of maps his point out in graphs. So overall, a very well-written book, a very well-researched book as well, and very easy to read. This is a book I think for everyone at the, in this day and age, just because it affects so, so many young people, pretty much everywhere, since smartphones are pretty prolific at this point and they're not going anywhere either. So it's definitely something that needs to be dealt with or at least better understood. All right, and we're on to the last book guys. So this is Lori Gottlieb's Maybe You Should Talk To Someone. Again, this is not particularly new. I just hadn't ever read it. 
And actually, I didn't read the physical book. I listened to the audio book. Um, I had gotten the physical book. I think I picked it up at half price at some point, but I ended up listening to audiobook because I did a lot of walking. So it was just nice to do that. I like this book. I think it was a nice collection of stories about people that she worked with in her therapy practice, but also her own experience in therapy as a therapist. So it was cool to see both sides of it. I think she provided some pretty good insights, both comedically, and, and that's kind of what I liked about it is she, she didn't take this too too seriously but she still was able to provide some insights into sort of like how people work and how people think um, in ways that I feel like were relatable and overall really fascinating um, and again very enjoyable read or listen I guess in my case all right guys so those are all of the books that I read this summer and rated five stars I think I'll do another video where I talk about some of the other books that I read that were either like mid or books that I read that were like I couldn't recommend them uh, for whatever reason. There's not too many of them though. So maybe I'll combine those two in a video. So yeah, all the rest of the books that I've read this summer that maybe weren't five stars. And then yeah, so as we wrap up the video, I just wanted to take a moment to thank anyone who is back here watching this video. It's been like a two year hiatus, mostly driven by the fact that two years ago I had purchased my uh, condo. And so it was just a very hectic time um, between moving and then all the, the work um, I did a lot of painting, picked up some minor renovation skills, etc. And you know, work as well. It's just been a busy time and I kind of let YouTube fall by the wayside. But I was thinking this summer, you know, I've really missed it. I've missed the community. I've missed talking to you guys and interacting with you guys. So the one goal I had was before summer was over, I had to film and upload a video. And I think that's sort of the biggest hurdle is just getting at least one video up there um, and sort of reestablishing how to use my camera and how to edit video, which, um, well, as I'm sitting here, I haven't quite gotten to that step yet, but hopefully I'll figure it out. And I hope to keep it up and um, post some more videos. I can't say with certainty how regularly I will be able to do that, but this was sort of the hurdle and the hump. And so we're over it and I'm really happy about that. So definitely stay tuned. Uh, let me know in the comments if you guys have any suggestions for video ideas or even books. I'm thinking in addition to the video about all the other books that I read this summer, I will be getting the actual bookshelf that I'm going to be putting all these books on. I'm waiting for it to be delivered and it should be here in a couple days. So I might film uh, organizing that. I could also go over my physical TBR, which has um, ballooned, if you will. I still have a reasonable number of books and I can read fairly quickly, so it's not a huge deal or anything, but I should probably get to work on that. All right, and with all that said, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It has been a pleasure to be back um, and I hope to see you again very soon. See ya.